together, uh, coexisting uh, predominantly a fungus and a photobiont, either an algae or a cyanobacteria, uh, living together. The fungus provides shelter, water, and some nutrients to the algae, and the algae creates sugars from photosynthesis to give to the fungus. Uh, lichens are very old, uh, evolutionarily speaking, and actually individually speaking. They, their fastest growth rate is about one centimeter per year, and therefore, uh, if you see a large lichen, you're probably looking at something that could be tens or hundreds of years old. Uh, a little bit more about myself before I get too carried away. Uh, lichens. Um, I am a graduate student at Florida International University. Uh, doing a master's thesis, actually, that has nothing to do with lichens. I'm studying another fungal symbiont, mycorrhizae, in pine rock worlds, uh, actually in Miami-Dade area, not in Big Cypress. Um, and so fungal symbionts are my main interest because they can tell us a lot about ecology of the system, and also they're very sensitive to change, either direct human impacts on an ecosystem or global climate change. Uh, and therefore they're very important to study. So this is not my thesis, this is a side project. <laughs> so I just love it so much. Um, so Big Cypress National Preserve, I chose this not entirely randomly. Uh, when I came to Miami, I began volunteering with Rick and Jean Seavey, who are volunteer lichenologists in Everglades National Park. Uh, and very inspired by their project, I was like, okay, if you guys look in the Everglades, let's look at Big Cypress. Uh, being an aspiring lichenologist, I had the crazy idea that I could just go in and study all the lichens that are here. But of course, Big Cypress, as we all know, is gigantic, and therefore I had to pick a smaller area for a case study. That smaller area is Hacking Point, which was chosen for two reasons. Uh, the road accessibility makes it easy for someone who hasn't really tromped around too much before in Cypress Domes. Uh, but additionally, as I mentioned, fungal symbionts, particularly lichens, are very sensitive to disturbances. And therefore, the fact that there's a road there and various operations going on at Raccoon Point, um, it would be interesting to see whether that disturbance has had an impact on lichen communities. So, a bit about the studies I have done and will be doing uh, in 2013. Uh, I started by just going in, and as you can see from these dome points, randomly picking a dome, oh, that looks good, let's go there. And uh, walking in and picking random trees to sample for lichens. This gave me an idea of the area and definitely also an idea of the general lichen diversity. I've already submitted some of my samples to the South Florida Collections Management Center. Um, but there's not many conclusions that can be drawn from this because it was totally haphazard. So, uh, in January and February of this coming year, I am going to um, excuse me, to uh, create transect studies where I look at cypress domes at varying distances from the road, and then also compare lichen communities within cypress domes, which brings me to cypress domes. As we all know, they're beautiful. They're very unique ecosystems, uh, very unique niches. Uh, they create sort of their own microclimate, which makes it very interesting in terms of studying lichens, some of which really love dry areas, some of which really love moist areas, and so you can actually see a gradient of lichen community composition as you walk through a cypress dome. And my coming study is going to investigate just how much that changes. So, uh, yes, very beautiful places. I included these extra pictures just to show that um, these domes are very unique, even amongst different domes, and so how much will that impact the lichen community as well? So a little bit more about lichens, coming back to the stuff I'm really passionate about. Um, they are ubiquitous. They are found everywhere from right underneath the Antarctic ice, to the tops of mountains, to deserts, to, yes, park benches. Uh, they can grow on everything from wood to rock to PVC pipe. Uh, if you give them enough time. Uh, many of the lichens you see here are what we call crustose lichens, meaning they look pretty flat. They almost look from far away like patches of color, uh, not actually anything important. But if you get up close, you can see that they are 
quite intricate little uh, organisms. So uh, to sort of contrast that park bench, we have a royal palm at an Inga Trail. I highly recommend any of you to check this out if you get over there. Uh, it is just a cluster of lichens. Um, and it sort of represents the ideal lichen habitat in that it's a very smooth surface tree. Uh, it is open to the air on all sides and also open to sunlight, but it's very close to moisture. And therefore, these lichens are very happy. Um, just a little introduction. I obviously can't cover all the lichens I've looked at, um, but in the diversity of lichens. So you can see here they come in all shapes, colors, and sizes. Uh, and a lot of the patterns that you see on them are actually their reproductive structures. So those cool stripes in the upper left-hand corner <laughs> are called Borelli. They are, uh, they contain spores within them by which the lichens reproduce. Down in the lower left-hand corner is something that an aspiring lichenologist has to learn right away. Neither the orange fuzzy stuff nor the green stuff. Is there a point? Oh, yes. Okay. <coughs> Neither of these are lichens. Um, and I have to learn that because once you realize that lichens are everywhere, you start seeing lichens everywhere. So you're like, yeah, lichen. And no, the orange stuff is free growing algae and the green stuff is liverworts. And so the great thing about studying lichens and their sort of microcosmic world is you get to know a whole bunch of other organisms that you would also pass by very quickly, like liverworts, mosses, tiny insects, algae, cyanobacteria, all of this uh, grows on the surface of the trees and the domes, and it's quite a fun world to explore. It can actually be quite a shocking world to explore, um, as I'm going to show in a couple slides in order to study lichens, we bring them back to the lab and look at them under a microscope. And when you have it that magnified, an ant can be quite a shocking monster. Uh, been spooked a couple times. So uh, just to show you some charismatic or favorite species of mine uh, that are fairly easy to recognize in the field and therefore you get to know them more quickly than some of the more cryptic species. Uh, Xenogonium up in the top. The common name is pixie hair lichen. It's an example of a filamentous lichen, uh, meaning that it um, has a very loose association with the algae and can look either poofy, as in this picture, or very red-like. Uh, Chrysophrix xanthina, which I believe was recently <coughs> changed to Chrysophrix candelaris. Uh, its common name is gold dust lichen, and it's very true. Not only does it look like gold dust, but if you touch it, will have gold dust on your fingers, and that's actually the asexual propules of this lichen, so you're spreading it around. Cryptothesia rubricincta, I believe is sometimes called the Christmas lichen, but it might go by some other common names as well. It can sometimes have a lot of green on it, which is, I guess, red and green, that's why I got its name. Cryptothesia refers to the fact that this can reproduce sexually as well as asexually, but its sexual reproductive, reproductive systems are not apparent, they're embedded in the ballast, and therefore it's uh, So this is what lichens look like in the laboratory. When you're out collecting in the field, there's a couple of rules you want to follow. If you see an awesome lichen, like say a xenogonium, you don't want to take that whole patch, you want to leave some there. As I mentioned, lichen grow very slowly, so to take the whole thing would take away years and years of hard work on the lichen's part. Um, so you just want one good phallus, one good representation. If it has reproductive structures, that's even better because um, that's helpful in identification purposes. And then, very similar to plants, you mount them on cardstock and they get put in an ovarian. So here's what I was talking about. In the field, that's what that lichen looks like. And then close up, you can actually see its reproductive structures. These nice little blobs right here. Um, and lichens are very diverse. They have all sorts of reproductive structures. These are, again, a sort of type of morelli, but there's also apothecia, which are little cup-shaped masses of spores, uh, and parathecia, which are sort of dome-shaped masses of spores, um, as well as many different asexual types of reproduction. Um, so to identify lichens, even though I've shown you some really iconic and diverse lichens, 
when you start working with them on an intimate level, you realize that they look a lot alike and they're actually rather hard to distinguish morphologically speaking. So you have to really um, get down to the microscopic level. And so we take cross sections, predominantly of the reproductive structures, and look for spores. Uh, it might be a little hard to see, but there's a spore right there. Cute little spore. So um, these can be very tiny, uh, very hard to see. And actually, a colleague of mine uh, is doing a study in California trying to capture lichen spores. And they're so tiny that uh, there's sort of a classic method of putting a sticky slide out and waiting for them to land on it. They're so tiny that they actually are repelled by the airflow over the slide. So your little lichen spores flying towards it goes right on out. So uh, they've actually had to develop spore vacuum traps just to capture these lichens, lichen spores. Um, and they're so tiny, in fact, that they can enter the upper atmosphere and travel all around the world. So you can find lichen species that are very similar in Florida and, say, Mongolia. Um, but you can also find some that are very unique based on habitat and stuff like that. Um, one really quick thing about lichens, if you're all interested, is, um, like I've mentioned multiple times, they reproduce sexually and asexually. When they're reproducing sexually, it's just the fungal part that's producing the spore and going off. And so if that little fungal spore lands in a place where there's no algae around, it will simply die. Um, so there has to be the right circumstances and the right partners available in order for a little lichen spore to actually create a new lichen. So quite some time ago, lichens developed the genius idea of just asexually reproducing, which means they um, break off a little part of themselves, which includes their photobiont. So it's like taking your lunch with you wherever you go. Um, and that has helped them to spread all around the world. All right, so um, before I get into my rant about my PhD, uh, I'm just going to sort of reiterate what I want to look at in this coming year, which maybe I will come back here to present next year, uh, is looking at lichen diversity at a close distance and far away from human disturbance, and also from the outside to the inside of the dome and how much that changes. And I'm going to look at lichen diversity in two different ways, one of which is morphology. So um, as I mentioned, lichens come in many different forms, and those forms sometimes reflect the environment to which they have adapted. Crestos lichens are very well adapted to um, dryness, as well as higher levels of air pollution than, say, a polios lichen, which are those pretty green lichens that most people picture when you think about lichens. Um, and so I will be looking at that. In addition, I will be taking my samples up to the Field Museum to work with a guy named Robert Looking, who uh, has worked extensively with tropical and subtropical lichens, and we're going to sequence them and try to see uh, if there are any patterns of relatedness based on uh, closeness and distance to human disturbance and dome community structure. Okay, so hopefully I haven't bored you completely with the awesomeness of lichens. I think they're truly really cool, and I think they're so awesome that I'm switching, I'm abandoning my horizon completely for my PhD and going back to lichens, which is my true love. Uh, and uh, what you see in this picture is a lichen interface, which is right here at this upper part. This white part is a lichen, and this lower part is also a lichen, and they are growing into one another. And not much is known about what's happening right there. Some lichens are known to be more competitive than others, which basically means at that interface they will <coughs> overcome the other one. But why? How? Is it a chemical thing? Is it just the rate of growth? Um, is it actually, um, there have been some studies that show that lichens are able to basically steal the photobiont from other lichens. You know, someone comes and steals your lunch. Um, and, and dinner and breakfast the rest of your life. Um, and also, there might be something happening at the mycelial level. Mycelium, for those of you who don't know, is basically what a fungus is. It's this tiny thread-like stuff. Um, and there have been some studies, not with lichens, but with other types of fungi, that show that at the mycelial level, 
fungi are interacting, almost like having a fist fight, but you know, tiny threads. Um, so that might be happening with some of these lichens, and that's what I hope to find out. So for my lichen project, I would like to send a big thanks to Rick and Jean Seavey. They've taught me basically everything I know, and they are totally amazing, not only lichenologists, but also mentors. Um, Dr. Susan Copter at Florida International University, who has kindly let me use her lab for a side project. And Dr. Jim Snyder, who has helped me gain access to Raccoon Point, as well as has been my field partner on a couple of occasions. And also William Hilton, who was a field tech, who helped me uh, gain access to Raccoon Point a couple of years ago. Uh, and thanks to all of you 